constitutional zone sometimes the struggle uh, if i remember correctly we were at the tail end of the perfectly competitive market um, uh, two flows can you confirm that for me i think somewhere somewhere here um, at the shutdown point right or we, we went beyond that Anybody can confirm for me, those who have gone through the video and those who were in the last class. Oh, these people didn't get time to read. <laughs> okay. Uh, Teoflos, are you here? You are filling in, so I have to reflect, bounce it off you. Uh, did we get to this point? Uh, sir, I'm... I'm, I'm... I'm, I'm updating myself with the video. Okay. Those who have updated themselves. Hey, please. I think um, we... Yes, come again. We go to economies of scale. Economies of scale. Yeah. So we finished this section. Um, I think the piece uh the long run oh yes the long run come again yeah the long run adjustments in perfectly competitive markets is that the case yes no. hey, people people are piling up the videos <laughs> then please we go on to the economies of skill We did this already. Yes, yeah, then, yes, we did all this in the, in the, the, the last, video. The last slide was and to the firm shutdown. Oh, but that's where I was before. Yes, sir. Um, that was exactly what, what, what I thought. Yeah. For the material to pile up. Right. Yes, sir. Energy. Yeah, should I, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I, I just wanted to confirm. Okay. All right. Uh, let me take it from here then. Let me mute everybody now. All right. So we've gone through the perfectly competitive market, some of the characteristics in that market. And, and then we said that in a perfectly competitive market, there are a lot of firms. And because of, because of the fact that there are a lot of supplies in the market, and also the, the free, free entry and free exit conditions, profit levels are not so high uh, in the market. Okay. And so we did a short run analysis uh, for com perfectly competitive market, where we are saying that in the short run, should the firm shut down if the firm is making losses? Okay. So the typical loss case will be where the average total cost of production on the average the average total cost of production is higher than the market price. And the question is, if the average total cost, the average cost of producing a bottled water, a bottle of water, if it's higher than the market price, the price in the market, in a perfectly competitive market, should the firm shut down? And we are saying that the firm shut down or temporary stop production, uh, uh, if, Yes, if price does not cover average variable cost. So we made at the end of the, the last session, we said that at least the price you get in the market should cover your operational cost, the variable cost component of your business. Okay. Even if it doesn't cover the fixed, the average fixed cost, at least the average variable cost should be covered. Okay. And you should not shut down if the price is at least equal to the average variable cost. So I think somewhere here, we ended the class and then we said the shutdown point, the point where you begin to consider whether or not to close down is where the market price equals the average variable cost. And we're saying this is the shutdown point, okay? So you run your own business. Um, you can always check that, okay? At least the price you are getting to cover your, your operational cost. If the price is lower than the minimum point of the average variable cost, then shut down. Otherwise, you continue to produce if the price you are getting at least is covering your 
operational cost or the average variable cost. Okay, so in summary, to summarize the competitive market, we are saying that in the short run and the conditions of perfect competition, the firm is a price taker. This has to be very clear. All firms in a perfectly competitive market take the price as given by the market. Okay. So you go to Accra Central, you don't know who is fixing the price for tomatoes. So you just know that the equilibrium price there is 10 Ghana cities. Okay. You're a price taker. If I'm going to sell tomatoes today or tomorrow in Accra Central, I'm just going to sell it at the market price, the prevailing market price. So I'm not a price maker. I, I cannot, firms in a perfectly competitive market cannot make prices. Okay. So that has to be very clear uh, for you. Marginal revenue equals average revenue equals price in a perfectly competitive market. So the additional revenue you earn equals just the market price. Okay. And we also explained that it also equals your marginal cost, the additional cost of production. So basically the price you are getting is not so different from the cost of production. Okay. You are not getting supernormal profit. Uh, you wouldn't get supernormal profit in perfectly competitive market. Okay. In the next few slides, I will explain why it's not possible in the long run to get supernormal profit in a perfectly competitive market. Okay. So profit are maximized where short run marginal cost equals marginal revenue and also average revenue. Supernormal profits can be earned in the short run uh, given by the extent to which price exceeds short run average total cost. So the extent, the gap between the price, so the gap between the price and your short run average total cost will, will tell whether you earn supernormal profits. But I'm saying that in the short run, you can make this supernormal profit, but in the long run, this profit is not sustainable. Okay. And we'll go into those conditions. Why is it that in the short run, this profit wouldn't hold in the short, in the long run? And the profit wouldn't hold. So uh, these are some of the conditions under uh, the short run case. So supernormal profit can be end given by the extent to which price exceeds short run to tackle costs and the profit maximizing output. Okay. Long run adjustments in perfectly competitive market. Uh, what happens in the long run? Okay. So you can think of markets that are perfectly competitive, uh, free entry, people are making money in those markets. We all will come into the market. Okay. Those who, who don't even, who haven't thought of that business will come into the market because we can all see the profits. So we all come in. Okay. Some decades ago when they were doing this space to space, everybody was doing space to space. The people who went into that business in the initial stage, the short run case, they made profit. But in the long run, when more people came into the market, the profit levels fell. Okay. So that is the, the, the idea behind the long run. Okay. So the long run adjustments is saying that, um, let's say in the short run, Okay, let's, let me pose this scenario. In the short run, there is an increase in ind industry demand. Okay. So you are producing a product. Um, somebody can give me a product, a product that is in a perfectly competitive market, that lots of producers, no price, they are all price tickets. Any example of a, a product or a sector? Pure water. Come again? Pure water. Pure water. Okay, okay. Let's take Melissa's pure water example. Let's say uh, Melissa produces pure water. Okay, and there is a, an increase in industry demand. All of a sudden, people, the preferences for pure water have just increased. So huge demand for uh, sachet water. What will happen to the profit levels for these people? So we are saying that an increase in industry demand will result in a positive economic profit for firms in a perfectly competitive market. So if there is a demand shock, all of a sudden, we all want more pure water. We are all demanding, we are all buying. Price for pure water will move, go up. Firms who have invested in that business long, a long time ago will make a lot of money. But if you are making a lot of money and we all can see you have a friend who is producing pure water 
and the guy is making a lot of money. The next moment, you also begin to set up this business. So we are saying that, however, the profits that are gained in the competitive market in the short run will be competed away okay, by the entry of other firms into the market. Because we can, we have free entry. So I can also produce sachet water or pure water. I don't know whether the pure water is talking about, Melissa is talking about was the, is the old one, the one that they twist. <laughs> As for that one, the entry is, entry barrier is it's, it's, the, Yeah, is the sachet. It's, it's, yeah, it's the sachet. But you still feel that the sachet is a perfectly competitive market. Yeah. Okay. There are a lot of producers. I yeah, even we have franchising and other things. So, there are franchising going on. Yeah, when it comes to cool, when it comes to cool, cool, vaulting. Okay, so when it comes to cool, what happens? The other people are producing it and using their name. Yeah, I see. Interesting. All right, let me take Dennis. Dennis, your hand is up. Look, no. Yes. I wanted to find out. I I believe um, an increase in demand generally should mean more profit for I mean any industry. Yeah. Why is it worth mentioning for a perfectly competitive firm? Like, why is it worth mentioning? Yeah. I will come to that of the other market, but for a perfectly competitive market, the key point here is that it, it, that that increase in demand, which results to positive economic profit that profit will not last. Okay. For other markets, that profit will hold. But for perfectly competitive market, it will not last because if I know Melissa is producing but sachet water and Melissa is making a lot of profit, the next time I'll also be producing sachet water. And because there's free entry and free exit, I can easily get the machines to produce. Now, Melissa is the only supplier on my block. And then I come in, another person comes in, we are all competing. We cannot then afford to increase price because price is fixed. So the profit levels will fall in the long run. Okay. So that is why it's worth mentioning this. So we are saying that the second point is saying that even though profits can be earned, the profit will be competed away by the entry of other firms into the market in the long run. Okay. In the long run. So it's not an, in the, like competitive markets are not markets where if you want to be a billionaire, for example, <laughs> it's not a competitive market. That market is not for you, right? Because the profit levels, even if you are making profit today, the next moment people flood the market. And you know, the typical Ghanaians, a lot of people have money sitting at home, but they just don't have ideas, <laughs> right? So if they see that a sector is booming, the next moment we are all selling sachet water the next moment we are all doing space to space okay so so this kind of mechanism is there and that ensures that profits are very low uh one second i'll just come to uh a table in a second uh, so the zero economic profit point or the point where price equals average total cost is the equilibrium point for the perfectly competitive firm for the perfectly competitive firm in the long run the price you are getting will just equal your average total cost Okay, so you can, if, if, if an industry in the, is in a perfectly competitive setting, you can just go and talk to some of the people there. On the item, they are making profits like 10 pesos, 5 pesos, like the kiosks and containers. Okay. You can go to a neighborhood and there are 10 lineup on one side and another 10 lineup on the another side. And they're selling almost identical product. The margins are close to zero okay, on an item. The average cost of of selling that product is almost the same as the price at which you are selling. Imagine five pesos, five pesos, five pesos, two pesos, that's all, okay? It's not so much, or 10 pesos or 50 pesos. It's not so much. So the zero economic point or the point where price equals average total cost is the equilibrium point for the perfectly competitive market. Yes, let me take the comment before I move on. Um, yes, Adam, Ebenezer. Yeah, so. Please, um, in the in the long run, let's say if I'll use the toothpaste as an example, whereby there are so many firms, uh, Colgate, Pepsodent, and uh, other uh, firms that produce toothpaste. 
in the short run, we know that they may be making some profit. But what if in the long run, they add some quality to their product, they improve on their quality and their branding, can that uh, help them to increase a uh, profit in the long run? So, so that market is not a perfectly competitive market. Okay, I cannot, I don't know. I, I don't know whether I can just get up and produce Pepsodent and Colgate. FDA and all those certification boards will come and after me. So, okay. so it's not a perfectly competitive market. So I can, there's no free entry and free exit. And so if we begin to talk about branding, yeah. it's not a pe in perfect competitive market, they don't brand. It doesn't make sense to brand. Okay. Yeah. Like you can't say Antiama will buy a, a air times a slot on radio and say that tomatoes is good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's good. Or eggs are very good for you. Yeah. Unless yeah. you move it into a market where you can brand your, your things, like a monopolistic competitive market or oligopoly market where you okay. can brand. But in a perfectly competitive market, uh, it doesn't make sense to spend money on advertising. We will go into those things, okay? We will go into those things. All right. So that, you're welcome. That is the, the case for the long run, okay? So long run adjustments. Uh, everything I've explained about the long run in terms of um, how profit will be competed away, how changes in demand can lead to more firms entering the market and how more firms can lead to a case where the price that the firm is getting from the market is exactly equal to the equilibrium. All that nice English can be, you know, economists, we don't like English too much. <laughs> can represent all that with a graph, okay? So uh, that is the graph. It's not very complicated, just try and follow, okay? Let's take the, the first point. The first point is saying there's an increase in industry demand. So what is the starting point? The starting point, the initial demand is D1. So the black lines uh, indicate the initial point. Okay, so initial demand is D1. Uh, by now you should know why demand is down what's looping. So it's D1. Initial supply is S1. So supplies up what's looping. The intersection point gives an equilibrium price of P1. So this market for sachet water is P1. That is the price. There's no demand change, okay? And at that P1, firms are just covering, so if you map it to the firm, the firm is just covering the average total cost. So the price P1 exactly equals the minimum of the average total cost, okay? The minimum, even if you're efficient, the minimum of the average total cost exactly equals the price. Now there is a demand shock. Okay. People are demanding more tear water or sachet water. D2, so D1 moves to D2. There's an increase in demand. When there's an increase in demand, as we've explained, that will lead to uh, a new inter intercept point, intersection point of this P, giving a price of P2. Okay. So higher demand results, results in higher prices. So milk starts P2. With a new price, if you map it to the firm, the new price is higher than the minimum of the average total cost. Meaning that at the new price PE2, firms will make profits, okay? So the gap between PE2 and the average total cost, the minimum of the average total cost will capture the, the, the industry or the firm's profits, okay? So I, as a non-sachet water producer, or not even contemplating producing sachet water, I'm seeing this gap, okay? The new gap, which is, has been triggered by higher demand. Okay. So I've seen this gap, and this gap is the profits that people in the industry are making. So now I buy the machine because there's free entry and produce. If I produce a lot of sachet water, supply will increase. So the new intercept, uh, intersection point will now be D2, the new demand, with uh, S2, the new supply. Because more people are producing because of the higher profits. Okay. It's like there is a drought this season for tomato, uh, and tom there's no tomatoes in the market. People plant so much. The next season is bumper harvest. So supply increases, prices will fall when supply increases. 
So in the long run, if you are making profit in a perfect competitive market, more firms will join, they will produce more prices so for you, come back to your old point where in the long run, the price you get will just be equal to your average total cost, okay? So in the short run, you can make profit, but in the long run, more firms will enter the market and you'll just be producing, uh, you'll be selling at the, the old price level, which just covers your average total cost, okay? So the profit levels, the gap here doesn't stay. It's not, it's, it's not fixed okay, in a perfectly competitive market. In a monopoly market, the firm is the only firm. So those, if there's a gap between price, it will stay. I'll go into those details uh, in a jiffy. All right, so let me just explain, uh, go through the, 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 the write-up. The long run I just meant here is saying that in the long run, the perfectly competitive firm has to choose just the optimal scale. So you have to just decide that in the long run, I will just produce Q1 or I'll just produce Q2, okay? And sell it at market price, okay? Given your average total cost, okay? Um, because the market price is going to be fixed okay, in the long run. This decision combined with entry and exit will force price to equal long run average cost. So in the long run, your price just equals your long run average cost, okay? So marginal revenue still equals to average revenue, which equals price, okay? Um, but profits are now maximized where long run marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So even in the long run, your marginal additional cost equals your the additional revenue you get selling one unit equals the additional cost of producing it, okay? In the long run. All right, so if there's super normal profit uh, and in the short run, that profit would disappear due to market entry. So the firms in perfectly competitive market can only earn a normal profit, okay? May, meaning that at least they, they will be able to cover the average uh, cost, uh, cost, or in this case, the additional revenue they earn will just cover the cost. They will not make super normal profits. They will not make profit price, profits be, beyond the average total cost. Okay. If you are following, if you follow the analysis for perfect competitive market very well, then it means that uh, firms in that market, you don't have an excuse for being inefficient. You have to be efficient because that is the only way you can make the only way you can make profit here is to make sure that your minimum of your average total cost curve is low. So the minimum cost of producing sachet water per sachet should be say five pesos or two pesos. So that if you sell it at 20 pesos, you are making 15 pesos profit, okay? But if on a sachet water you are producing it at 50 pesos and you are selling it at 20 pesos, you will be making losses. So there is a need for um, efficiency. Yeah, if you are not efficient and you are selling it at, uh, and therefore your average cost is 50 Ghana and you want to sell sachet at 50 Ghana, nobody will buy because there are a lot of options in the market. It's perfectly competitive. We can move to other producers, okay? So in this market, we are going to talk about productive and allocative efficiency. Firms have to be efficient in this market. Monopoly market, if the firm is not efficient, they just pass the price on to consumers. In competitive markets, if you're not efficient, there's nobody to pass it on to. Because if you want to pass it on to me as a consumer, until I'm selling tomatoes on the side, you cannot say you are selling yours today for 50 Ghana, a basket. One until I'm who is closer to you is selling for 15 Ghana, okay? People move. So you better be efficient and find the product at the cheaper Cost so that you can sell at the lowest price. Okay. All right. So productive efficiency and allocative efficiency. What do we mean by these concepts when we talk about these concepts? Okay. Productive efficiency, we say it occurs when a firm minimizes the cost of producing any level of output given the technology. So given your technology, given your uh, technology, uh, how do you minimize the cost of producing 
any level of output that you decide. So it's more minimizing the cost, as I said. Okay. Getting the input at a cheaper price, uh, getting reliable supplies, all that. Yeah. It is, it is a, as a result of two efficiencies. So for the, under productive efficiency, you have technical efficiency. So you have to be technically efficient and then price efficiency. Okay. So under this broad efficiency concept, production, uh, productive efficiency, you need to be technically efficient and you should have price efficiency. Technical efficiency occurs when inputs, so that is where your technical skills comes in, how you combine the inputs. So occurs when inputs of the factors of production are combined in the firm in the best possible way to produce the maximum level of output. So how do I combine my capital and labor, the number of workers and capital stock to produce the highest output? Okay. So here you see that it's not talking about cost directly, but more on the management of your resources, the inputs that you have okay, to produce the maximum output. Okay. So the key is um, efficient combination of inputs and maximum production of output. Okay. So if workers come to work and they come at 11 o'clock and they leave at four, but you're paying them for the day, yeah, or yeah, you have more people as CEO in your company and less people, fewer people as um, factory produ uh, producers, then you are going to have a problem. You are not effect efficiently combining your input. Okay. So combine the input in the best possible way to maximize output. Price efficiency. This occurs when input into production are optimally employed, given their prices, so as to minimize costs. So price efficiency is saying that, okay, how, what is the cost of labor? The input price. So what is the cost of labor? What is the cost of capital? How, how many compu cap uh, cap computers can I buy and how many workers can I employ? Maybe I should use more computers because it, it's cheaper relatively and therefore um, the price, when I look at the production cost with two computers and five workers is better than 10 workers and one computer, okay? So the price efficiency is looking at the cost component, okay? While the technical efficiency is looking at the output. Okay? So you still, you want a desired output, but how do I produce this desired output at the minimum cost, okay? So, these things, these two efficiency concepts combine to give us productive efficiency. All right, so if you combine it very well, then uh, firms should be in the long run still be producing at the minimum cost, okay? So the average total cost curve for efficient firms should be here where you are productively efficient at the minimum. If you are at point B, you are inefficient because you are producing lower quanti lower quantities or lower output, but the price is even higher, okay? The average cost is higher than the price. So you are going to make losses. So you have to drive your production system to a point where the average cost of production is at least equal to the price, okay? So that's why we always emphasize uh, producing at the minimum cost, the minimum ATC, average total cost. If you produce at C, you are super inefficient. The cost is so high, you are, you are far from your minimum cost. You are not efficient, okay? You're far from the minimum cost, okay? And so you work on your business. Make sure that uh, yeah, it's hands-on. Make sure that you don't start a business and leave it for somebody uh, without the oversight, otherwise you'll be at point C and you're producing less quantity and you're always making losses, okay? So um, don't become the typical Ghanaian business, the person will cross the leg and then asking people to go around it. Some are stealing, <laughs> it's affecting output and then your cost is also high. That is the worst thing. When your output is low or you don't have the highest output and at the same time have rising costs, okay? That is a disaster for your business. 
All right, we talked about um, productive efficiency and allocative efficiency. You've already emphasized productive efficiency. We will look at a broader concept of allocative efficiency. Okay. So allocative efficiency at the core of allocative efficiency is the fact that resources are scarce. Okay. So you have a resource constraint. So we are saying that allocative efficiency denotes the optimal allocation of scarce resources. Okay. So I have 10,000 to start a business. I have a scarce resource, okay? So, uh, so as to produce the efficient, denotes the optimal allocation of scarce resources. So as to produce the combination of outputs which best accords with consumer demands, okay? So allocatively, how do I allocate my 10,000 in such a way that I'll produce a good that has the highest demand, okay? So if, if I'm inefficient, I'm going to use my 10,000 to try to produce a car, <laughs> okay? And I can buy even a screwdriver, okay, All right? But if I acknowledge my scarce resources, then I will allocate it in such a way that I'll produce, I don't know, sachet water uh, that, has that has some demand or there's demand for, okay, in the market. So, you should sit back, look at your resources, and then see how do you combine, okay? How do you use that resource to produce a combination of output that the market wants, so allocatively. So this is like the first step, okay? Allocate your resources well. And then after the allocation, then you go into the production, right? The productive efficiency, uh, the technical part and all that. But allocatively, uh, acknowledging consumer demand and acknowledging your scarce resources. So in other words, no other, when you talk about locative efficiency, if you have allocated your resources efficiently, then no other allocation is superior to your first, right? So let me give, just give you an example. If I decided that I'm going to use my 10,000 to produce sachet water, right? That means that that 10,000 cannot produce anything that will give me a higher return, okay? If there's any other location that will give me a higher return, then going into sachet water is not optimal, right? So if using that 10,000 for a carpentry shop will give me a higher return, giving my resources, so giving my money, giving my skill set, if I can produce, I can go into carpentry and I can also go into sachet water production. If I choose sachet water production, that means that any other location from sachet water is not optimal because if it was optimal, that is the optimal choice. I would have taken the optimal choice. Okay. So it goes into like Pareto optimality, the concept of Pareto Optima, okay? So in other words, no other location of resources would produce a higher level of economic welfare given the existing consumer demand. So given the demand for sachet water, given the demand for, I don't know, tables and chairs and wardrobes, given my resources, my skill sets, uh, in terms of production of sachet water and wooden products, if I choose sachet water, then it must be optimal. No other location is better than sachet water, okay? So that is it, okay. it has to be optimal. So that is the key aspect uh, about the, allocate your resources optimally or efficiently. So as I said, it takes you to directly into that area of Pareto optimality, making sure that the option that you choose is superior to all other options. Any changes, uh, if any change can improve your life, then that, that old allocation is not optimal. Okay. So I will say that I'm an optimal point because that is the highest point I can get to. If there's somewhere higher than where I am currently, the where I am is not optimal. So that is a thinking behind it. Imperfectly 
competitive market, uh, a private competitive market is allocatively efficient. You cannot be in a private competitive market without being allocatively efficient, because if you don't allocate your resources very well, somebody will do that and its cost of production will be lower than yours and will make more money in the market. So we are saying that firm, all firms in that market try to be allocatively efficient. If you are inefficient in that market, you will lose. Your price will be greater than your marginal cost. Your price will be less than your marginal cost. Okay. So in private competitive market, price equals marginal cost. Okay. If you don't do that, your cost will rise higher than the price you are out of the market. So efficiency is very key here. All right. So as I said, the, the broad concept of uh, efficiency is linked to Pareto optimality. Okay. Uh, the concept of Pareto optimum. What is Pareto optimum? It's even with your life. <laughs> you have to be at the Pareto optimal level, right? You have to get to a point where, where you, if you've reached and say, at this point, I am done. It means that you've reached your optimum. No other, you can't do anything else in the, with your life to improve your outcomes, okay? All right, so you are in graduate school because you are not at your optimal level yet. <laughs> Maybe getting education, a little bit of master's will push you a bit higher, okay? So you get to your peak where no, um, there's nothing else you can do, okay? You've reached your peak. In life, even at 45, some people reach their peak. There's nothing they can do again. And so for some people at 60, they are still trying to better themselves. So that is the idea, okay? All right. A Pareto optimum is said to exist when resources cannot be reallocated. You have reached your peak. You can't do any allocation so as to make one person better off okay? without changing anybody else life okay okay so you society is said to be in an optimal level when any other location will make somebody worse off okay so if you try to make somebody better off somebody will be worse off okay so then we are in a Pareto optimum case okay it's 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 a big concept that especially we use um or the world bank will use when you're building roads and other things okay because you want to build a road uh, to serve a lot of people, so people will be better off. But can you build a road in such a way that nobody is made worse off? Very tough to accomplish, right? Because you may have, especially in developing countries, <laughs> you have squatters all along the road, right? So if you build a road, squatters will be affected, and the World Bank will say that, or donors will say that, then compensate them so that they are not worse off. Okay, so that is that goes into the whole compensation uh, scheme. And that's what people say, then you don't allow them to come in the first place. But if you do, and you're going in for a World Bank grant, you have to do all these analysis, who is going to benefit uh, the spillover effects. And then you go in and say, okay, so we compensate people, even kiosks and containers and all manner of things. Because of Pareto optimality, how can we improve the lives of some people without making others worse off? And yeah, so a crack, what was the name? The Achimota uh, uh, Highway some years ago, we paid so much compensation just to expand the road. So that I could have built ad additional roads, but people were going to be made worse off. Even people with that documentation, you may have to compensate them. Okay. All right, so that is the idea. Okay, let me summarize this whole optimality concept. There are three main conditions that must exist in order for a Pareto optimum to be achieved in a, in a society, <coughs> a broader society. Um, Pareto optimality is achieved one on, on the goods on the goods market, the imports, and then on the app uh, the outputs. Okay, so in the goods market, we are saying that goods must be optimally distributed between consumers, so that no reallocation increases welfare. Okay, if I go to the central market area and I bargain for a product and we all decide that I decide to buy it and the seller decides to sell it, then, the, then it's optimal for me because no other location would have made me better off. Okay. If I could move from that seller and go to somebody else and I will be better off, 
then the, that old allocation is not optimal. So the fact that I bought the good means that it's optimal. Okay, so it's embedded, rationality is embedded in that. Okay, so it's optimal because if it's not optimal, then I should walk away and look for a better allocation. So goods must be optimally distributed between consumers so that no reallocation increases welfare. Okay. But if I can go somewhere else and get um, and get a, 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 a better deal, then I should do that. Okay. So you can't blame some people. They will walk through the market for hours. <laughs> Just making sure that they are dealing with the equilibrium price. <laughs> okay. They will ask everybody. So some of us you ask the first person, second person, you are almost close to a equilibrium price. There are some people in this world, uh, they, even if it's one Ghana, they spend three hours. Okay. All right, so goods market, uh, they, they are saying that the, the first condition is that uh, the goods market generates the efficient, optimal distribution of goods between consumers. Input markets, inputs are located in such a way that no reallocation will increase the physical output. If you're a CEO and you are allocating even workers, different types of workers, to factory floor, to uh, marketing, then you should allocate them in such a way that no reallocation will increase output. But if you can move more people into marketing, that will increase your profit levels or your output then the old allocation of people are not optimal. Okay, so you see people testing it to see whether they've reached their peak. Okay, maybe I put five workers on, on the production line, I put two workers in the store, and then I put 10 in, the, in, mar on, in marketing. If it's not working, you increase the number of people in the store and see the effects. Okay, so you hit a point where you see that this allocation yields the highest output or outcomes for you. Okay. Uh, optimal amount of each output are produced so that no change in output will lead to a higher economic growth. At the aggregate level, the output that we produce is also optimal. Okay, so optimal amount of each output is produced. So change output and make people's life better off then the old allocation is not optimal. So if, if this class was a development finance class, I would have explained in detail that uh, in a lot of developing countries, we are not at our optimal, okay? Solving a lot of the problems, we need to change our location, okay? Where we put the money, okay? Do we buy V8 or do we put the money into something? Okay, how do we allocate the resources so that um, it's optimal, it's perhaps optimal for all of us, okay? Are we at an efficient point, okay? If you are putting, a lot of people in certain positions and less people in the production, what happens? If you employ so many people in public sector and uh, the wage bill goes up, how? How are you allocating the people that are, that are coming out from the universities so that output overall will increase? Okay. How do you have allocate the total revenues that we get from uh, a year in, year out? How do you allocate it to our needs in such a way that it's optimal? If different allocations can improve our lives, then old allocation is not optimal. Okay. So that's why we're always constantly thinking about what can we do to improve the system. Okay. And you, this is at the economy level, you do that. But also at the firm level, as the CEO, you also have to do that. Okay. And we go into macro, I'll go into the economy level. But at, this, at the firm level, you cannot employ 20 workers and they are all sit on their phone for two hours and hoping, and then you produce 10 bucks and you think that that is the, the, the highest you can produce is 10 bucks. That is not true. We are at a suboptimal level. If these guys can put their phones down, you will be producing 100 bucks, okay? It means that, that uh, the way your system is structured is not optimal. All right, in, perfectly, in a summary, in perfect competitive market, these optimality conditions are all met or have to be met. Okay. If you are not optimal in a perfectly competitive market, you are out because you cannot pass on higher cost of production to consumers. You can all easily go to other firms to purchase. Okay. All right, uh, let me summarize the key points here. In the short run, so key points on perfectly competitive market, 
in the short run until the entry or exit of sufficient firms super normal profits or losses can exist in perfectly competitive markets. However, in the long run, once the process of market adjustment, demands increase, supply response, uh, in the long run, once the process of market adjustment is complete, only a normal profit can be earned. Okay. In the long run, Pareto optimality is achieved. So in the long run, you have to be optimal. Like that is the maximum you can produce. Okay. So you have to reach your optimal point. Perfect compet competitive market or perfect competition drives profit down to a normal level. Okay. So lots of firms will enter and therefore provide consumers with low price products. So for us as consumers and as, even as economists, we like perfect competitive market. Why? Because pr prices are low, relatively lower than in other markets. And there are a lot of varieties in the market. So I can go to another firm to buy. Okay. So it provides consumers with low price products and services. Okay. If you have a monopoly market pr product, the price level will be very high. Also, firms in perfectly competitive markets operate at optimal scale in the long run. So as we are saying, um, you have to do the best for your company if you are in a perfectly competitive market. Okay. So the sachet water example, a sachet water producer can say that for me, I'm producing 5,000 bags a week. That is what is optimal for me. Okay. Given my, the demand in the market, given my resources, given the input price, given the output price, my optimal in the long run is 5,000 bags a week. A week I'm done. If I go beyond it, the cost will rise because nobody will buy it and the price will increase. Okay. So these are the uh, idea. If you can avoid such a market, you should if you want money, if you want to make it big. But for us on the consumer side, we like this market. So economists, we favor the perfectly competitive model because it achieves economically efficient and welfare maximizing outcomes for us, for the society. Okay. More fans, um, lower prices, it's good for us. Okay. All right, any question? Any question on the perfectly competitive market? You can raise your hand, I'll call you. Yes, any question? Can also leave me comments. I'll read. I'll read the comments. All right. So now let's go into how to manage if you find yourself in a monopoly market. How do you manage in a monopoly market? In one of my classes, I think the executive MBA class. For that market, there's no management. <laughs> You're alone in the market. Okay. So let's see. Uh, maybe the person is not too far from the truth. What are the conditions for monopoly market? We've gone through them uh, in that table some a week ago. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. Single firm supplies the entire output. Okay. If you are lucky to find this product, you are in a dreamland. Okay. You are the only firm you produce for the entire Ghana or produce for the entire world who you will be like the Amazons and the Facebooks. Okay. So this is an, a very important market. The product is unique. You can't get a product anywhere. It does not have any close substitutes. Okay. Um, any examples? Any examples? Monopoly. In Ghana, any product that is a monopoly? Any anybody? Maybe. Um, Leptin. Yeah, Melissa. Leptin. 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 <laughs> yeah. Melissa, I'm a tea addict, you can see. But I, I, I have it. There's a lot of variety in the market for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Yes, come again. <laughs> Melissa, let me take Melissa. I'll come to Ebenezer. Melissa, you were, you were saying something, a follow up. Yes. Don't. With the lectern, 
we have other tea beverages, but it, it's it cannot be compared to lectin. Those ones. Yeah, but there are other are, substitutes in the market. Hey, please, me, I've not met one. The others that I know, they are just for health and other things. Oh, you should come yeah. to my office. I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> you. I will show you the varieties. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, we will come to that market. That is not a monopoly market. Uh, so we come to that market. Um, yes, uh, Beneza, and, and there's another, there's another, okay, let's take. It's a, electricity supply is monopolistic. Yeah, uh, mm. Beneza came back. Beneza wanted yes. to say ECG is definitely monopolistic. <laughs> yes, and for which matter, what the whole nation is uh, cut off, then we all have to wait in endless anticipation and. Uh, yeah, the, the, past week, the past week has been like that. People have to pray. Mm. Uh, yes. Well, have to pray. You can't switch. Where are you switching to? I use the generator for a few hours. I hate leaving generators on. So before you go to bed, it has to go off. So you, you don't have a perfect substitute for that. Okay. Uh, let me take patience and then I come to Benson. Patience. So, um, please, Coco Ball. Ooh. Yeah, explain it. Patience, you understand Coco Ball's. Yeah, they are the only um, institution in Ghana that buy and sell cocoa. Okay. I hear some people have come in, but I don't know how uh, the regulations into the niche market, the organic and those things. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, as an institution, they are maybe. They're the only. Uh, some people are mentioning SNFs. Benson, come in. Are uh, you a gas company? Is there a monopoly there? Is yes, there only one firm in that. Come again, Benson. I, I missed I, it. I, I think so. What, what, what yeah, firm yeah. is there that? No, it's not. Single uh, okay. firm supplies the entire output. I'm not aware. Okay. Um Steven, let me take Steven. Your hand is up. Ghana Water. Ghana Water had a monopoly for a long time. But Ghana Water yeah. now, a lot of people have boreholes. So their monopoly power is coming down. People have a lot of options. It's just like with the solar panels are still expensive. Some of us would have switched long, long time. Long, long time. It's just that the, the, you need a stronger battery and all those things otherwise. Uh, and people are even doing the mix. But the Ghana water, I'm sure even if you interview people in this class, probably half of them have their own boreholes. But there was some years ago, their pipe will break and the water will flow for a week and you call them and it's like you're even bothering them. Because right? they can easily pass it on the cost. But now they can't do that. Okay, okay let me read some of the comments. Um, what people are saying, Ghana water, SNIT, GRE, I don't know about that one. <laughs> SNIT is not purely monopoly. They, some institutions have their own pensions. So uh, university lectures, you're on a different pension. So it's not on SNIT. Some people can volunteer and join SNIT. Uh, you have to, it, it, when it comes to pensions, you need, to, you need a backup. You need like a poultry farm or something to back you up. <laughs> Otherwise, old age will not be fun. Okay, you need a backup, strong backup system, especially in our setting. Okay, if you look at the pension numbers, you cry. You, can, you cannot put all your hopes on that pension. Okay, you you may still have to resort to you depending on your children. Bismarck, yeah, Bismarck. So at least, why is it so with our pension? Why can't we? do something about it since we, we are not uh, the population is not too large that yeah we can't even manage the few resources to cater for our pension yeah. so hmm, allocation issues allocation issues so people allocate their funds and it's suboptimal but it's okay you know so these are it's a big problem how do we invest the resources in such a way that we can provide people with decent 
salaries. And the weird thing in Ghana is that people don't care about their retirement till they are actually a few years to their retirement. So this consumption is so important to people that like they drive the Mercedes, they live in a big house, blah, blah, blah. But they don't think about the, when you can actually walk, you know? So, so it's, whilst in other countries, people are just, the first day you begin work is the day you think about retirement. So people are saving towards that stage. But here, and even for you, for some people, you'd be surprised that they've worked for so many years and they don't know their level of contributions yet. They don't know. They just know that the employer deducts. But as to whether it even goes to <laughs> where it's supposed to go, they don't know. So they wake up and they are giving 200 Ghana and 300 Ghana and at 60. At 60, um, the retirement is a very difficult one. I always say that that sector is even more deadlier than the banking sector. Because for the bank, if I lose a few 50,000, 100,000, I'm still young, I can still work, right? But for pensions, if you wake up at 60 and the money is not there, you are in trouble, <laughs> you know? So the regulations have to be very tight on that. And they have to allocate the money well. You don't put people's money in very risky assets so that you can pay back and then they get peanuts at 60. Yeah, so if you, if you had, if you finish after this program of those who are next, please, and you become the CEO or in charge of a very important position, please, allocative efficiency. If you don't allocate it very well, I'll call you and send you the slides and tell you the page number. Okay. <laughs> we have to improve the system for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, come in. Somebody is saying something. Please come in. Yeah. Sometimes people in position feel they're doing us a favor, but it's all of us. All right. So single firms, uh, a single firm supplies the entire output. The product is unique. It doesn't have any close substitute. Uh, in that sector, for example, yeah, Francis, ask your question and then I can move on. Um, Please, can we classify the a school of law that macula as a monopoly okay i am teaching you the characteristics <laughs> disclaimer uh, uh, i don't know the school of law if it's the only law school and that is the only way you can become a, a lawyer then it's the only firm if, if it supplies the entire output the whole country the product is unique it does not have any close substitute there are high barriers to entry uh, yes i know francis will say yes 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 high barriers to entry um information asymmetry you don't know you just don't know their production cost you don't even know the criteria <laughs> francis your question came at the wrong time yeah information asymmetry uh, can be a problem okay we don't know uh, what they are investing in so you we just don't know so for like the uh, monopolistic firms, you don't know their minimum cost. They can just tell you that, oh, the, the cost of producing a kilowatt of energy is this, and now it's becoming expensive. So we have to increase the electricity bill or you know, rates. Okay. You just don't know. There's huge information asymmetry. Any uh, questions? Uh, with, the, with the law school, yeah. we are the only law school, law school in the country. If you want to be a lawyer in Ghana, you pass through that uh, school. If not, so you can't be. You can be a qualified barrister or a lawyer. And, uh, sir, I've been waiting for uh, I've been waiting for three years out of frustration. I I will find an MBA. So I for three years. Yes, sir. To uh, Since become 20, a lawyer. I've been waiting to enter. Actually, I finished LLB in twenty eighteen. I've been waiting to enter. Twenty. And it's been three years already. With a bachelor degree in law. Yes, sir. So what happens? I've been thinking about that. What happens? If you don't, if you get an LLB and you don't have like any other degree, but it's an LLB and you don't get into law school, what do people do? So then you have to, the unfortunate thing is that in, in the London and other places, we have a solicitor and we have a barrister. In Ghana, you have both, you can't yeah. both, uh, both a, a, a solicitor and a barrister after law school. So you just hold an LLB in law and that's just what it is. Wow. And that's the beginning to find other routes like uh, taking MBA just in case uh, uh, law school never comes up. 
Wow, interesting. Um, the MBA is not a bad degree, so uh, maybe maybe you had information asymmetry. <laughs> so I know some people is law or suicide. Uh, it's like the medical school people. Yeah, but um, yeah, if you hold monopoly, that is the case. In very competitive markets, like having an MBA, you have to be very efficient. You have to be, uh, once you have it, you need to push, right? Uh, um, this is not a labor economics class, so I will not go into that, but you get it. You, you, you cannot be suboptimal. Like I have an MBA, I'm sitting at home. You have to really push. Uh, it's a very competitive market, so you have to push. But the good thing is that those who push, they do very well. So uh, that is what you have to do. But the truth is that a law degree with a finance background or economic background is the best. So you never know, maybe in the long run, it will all come together. That you have your LLB, you have a finance background, commercial law and those things can be uh, very lucrative, I think. Okay. Oh, it's very lucrative. So if you add it, and uh, one day you, you go through, you may find yourself in a better position than those without that background. Okay. So everything happens for a reason. Okay, um, the law school. Maybe it's, I don't know how difficult it is, but uh, maybe they don't have space. Maybe it's resource constraint. Mm. All right, sources of market power. What gives firms or institutions power, market power? Okay. Um, so we'll touch on some of the factors and that gives institutions power. First, economies of scale. Some firms are just so large or so big that if you are going in to compete with them, you are not so, their size makes them um, a natural monopoly. Okay. They are so big and because they are big, they are they are able to also to produce at the minimum cost. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me mute everybody. We are in the era of multitasking. Okay, so economies of scale. So the scale effects are huge, and therefore uh, prevent other others from entering the market. Uh, sources of market power: barriers created by government. Government cannot create barriers. So you need licenses, you need patents, you need copyright uh, that creates, it gives some few firms the power in the market. So it gives some few firms power. And um, uh, input barriers. Okay. So input barriers, uh, a firm controls the inputs and wants to sell it to you, you will not. Or if you will sell, you will sell at a higher price. Okay. If you're competing with a firm on an output, but the input is controlled by that firm, they become powerful in the market, okay? So input barriers. I always say that if you have your own business and there's a very important input business and you have the chance of buying that input company, you should. If you control the, the number one input, control the market. Okay. Um, brand loyalty. Somebody was talking about uh, the what product, Lipton. And for the, the loyalty is so strong that people may begin to think that Lipton is the only product in the market when it comes to tea. Okay. It's the only product in the market. So uh, barriers are created by government, like input barriers, brand loyalty can be very high. For some people, it's either Pepsi, it's either Coca Cola or nothing else. Okay. The loyalty is strong. It gives Coca Cola a strong power. In the in the market, I don't know. I don't know whether you got find you got still has that power or the other brands uh, in the market. I'm not so sure about that. Okay. Any question? Any product in Ghana that has a very strong loyalty is so difficult to break down. Any other pro any product? Nestle. Nestle, then yeah, products. like Milo, Ideal, Cerilac. Though they, there are other products like the Promacido products, like um, Young Vita and the others, but people still want Milo. Milo is Milo, wow. and Ideal is Ideal. You taste Ideal and you taste 
um, cowbell and you realize that <laughs> there is a vast difference. I see. Uh, so for Melissa, there's a difference. Key soap. For some of us, sometimes it, key soap. For some, some of us, it, it was, your taste and preference, sometimes it depends on your income, right? If your income is low, milk is milk. <laughs> the milk will do. Uh, Pepsodent, people are giving me Pepsodent, ideal. Yeah, patience. What product? Oh, it's the Sorry, old Sorry, it's a previous hand. Okay. Yeah. Bismarck. So please, uh, I, will, I was about to talk about the, the pricing and the yes, income. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if, if the prices are high and uh, relatively your, incomes, your income is low, I don't think this thing will matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, if, 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 if your income is low, uh, you even say Gary without milk is good for your health, right? If your, income is <laughs> if your income is high, then you are saying, oh, I do is not the same as Kanishi and all that. Yeah. So yeah, brand loyalty depends. Some of us, we have no loyalty to anything. Whatever is there. Uh, we even go and say the product is not there. And grab whatever and go away. Okay. As long as it's not expired and has like decent quality, uh, the taste is important, but all right. So now let's go into the, the difference here. When you look at the monopoly case and then the perfect competitive case, okay? Remember that a perfect competitive firm, the price is fixed, right? So for a perfect competitive firm, let me use the whiteboard. For a perfect competitive firm, uh, the price is fixed. So, if you remember correctly, the price is given, so it's fixed. And then you put your price there, price P5 Ghana, if that's the price. All you have to do is to superimpose in the perfect competitive market to make profits, you superimpose your cost on this. So the average cost, average total cost. And then the difference here tells you your profit, right? So difference here between the minimum cost will give you your profit. So if you go through that, that will give you your profit. This is for a perfect competitive firm. So we are saying that for a perfect competitive firm, price is uh, your price taker, it's fixed. It's coming from the market conditions. For a monopoly firm, price is not fixed. So the price, the demand facing the firm is downward sloping, it's not fixed. The monopolist decides the price. Okay. So for monopoly firm, let me use the same graph to adjust this. So for a monopoly firm, the demand is downward sloping. So the monopolist is facing a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. So the monopolist makes the price, the price maker. So in this side. The price maker. So that is one of the key first differences, first difference you should keep in mind. Okay. So as a firm in the market, the monopolist demand curve is also the market demand. Okay. So the entire market demand is the monopolist demand curve. Because the monopolist is the monopolist is the only firm in the whole market. So the consumer demand for the good is the demand for that monopolist product. Okay. So the monopolist is on the is the only firm on the supply side of that market. So we are saying that as a firm in the market, the monopolist demand curve is also the market demand. In a competitive market case, the market demand and supply decides the price, and firms take the price as given. In the monopolist case, the monopolist demand is actually the one that influences the market demand. Okay. So we are saying that the monopolist faces a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. It's not fixed. The monopoly can increase the price or reduce the price. As with the, when we talk about quantity changes in demand and changes in quantity demand, and the monopolist can control that. Private competitive market, you cannot. Okay. So we can see here that 
if you go back to the whiteboard, the monopolist can decide that as for me, I want to sell my ten at ten Ghana City. Let me mute everybody. So I want to sell at 10 Ghana cities and produce only 10, I don't know, kilowatts of energy or megawatts of whatever. So let's say I want to sell per kilowatt at 10 Ghana, but I will not produce so much. But for monopolies, if they, they don't produce a lot, so Q1, Q1, you decide to produce um, uh, 20 units of or kilowatts of energy. Monopolis is free. Monopolis is also free to say that I will sell at five and produce more. So sell at five and produce more. Okay. Um, so they make the price. They are free to make that price. Okay. Five and produce 40. Typically, the mon monopolist will stick to a lower quantity and a higher price, okay? or lower quality and a higher price. Because there's nowhere you, you can't go anywhere. See, I'm selling it at 10. Where else are you going to get the power uh, from? So you still buy. So they can ration it. They can create shortage and drive up prices and then uh, have a lot of uh, uh, revenue. If the power fluctuations, um, <clears throat> Uh, continues for a long time, and you come around and ask people their willingness to pay for a stable power electricity, people will be willing to pay higher for stable power. So inefficiencies are high, people pay, they pass it on. Okay. The monopolist demand is the market demand. The whole demand facing the monopolist firm is the market demand. They, create the, they are in the market. They are the only firm in the market. Okay. Um, so in that case, we are saying that to sell more, the monopolies has to can reduce price to sell more, or they don't have to do that. They can just increase the price, reduce the quantity, and still make more. Okay. <clears throat> this means that the additional revenue, uh, the marginal revenue, will not equal the price, because the additional revenue that they will, uh, they will get, okay, the additional revenue they will get will not equal the price. We can show that the additional revenue will be lower than the price. Okay. They are going to charge, or the price here will be higher. The price will be higher than the additional revenue. Okay. Uh, because they are going to charge a price which will be higher than what they should, would have earned uh, under a competitive price, under a competitive market. So the price will be higher than the additional revenue that they're supposed to get. So, so they are free. They can charge a price. Uh, let me go back to the whiteboard. Let me can just say that you can put your additional revenue somewhere, marginal revenue, which will be lower than the, the price. Okay. So they are free. They can just charge a higher price and uh, sell at this. Uh, charge 10 Ghana, so produce 20 units. And if it was in a competitive market, the additional revenue will be exactly equal to the price. But in a, in a monopoly market, the price will be higher okay, than the, what the additional revenue is supposed to be. And that is why we economists don't like the monopoly market. They will overcharge their marginal revenue okay, uh, or marginal cost. Okay, let me skip this one. Okay, so the key here is that uh, the monopolist, this is the demand curve. The monopolist is going to charge a price P1, which is higher than C1, okay, the, the average cost. And this gap here, unlike the, the, unlike the competitive market, this gap here can hold for a long time. Why? Because there will be no entry and exits, like nobody's coming in to increase supply for this price to come down. Okay. So for the monopolist, if, he, if you anger him, he's just going to increase it to P2 okay. and increase um, the price. Okay. So monopolist, 
uh, they create inefficiencies in the market. They can just uh, increase it far beyond what the market, uh, the, the cost of production is. So they are producing, if, if we had only, um, somebody was telling me in one of my classes, if we, we had only gasem in the market, we'd be buying cement at 200 Ghana back. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know whether I believe him. I don't know what would have happened because we don't have them alone in the market. But he is saying that they would have increased the price so much. But because of other firms in the market, it's pushing the price, uh, I think around 40, 40 to 45 or something. But if it was the only firm, they will pass on all their inefficiencies. But now the other firms, so you are competing with them. So you are forced to be productively efficient. So that is the key point here. The point here is that for monopoly firms, prices are higher than the average and can be way higher. Okay. I think a year or two ago, there was a gentleman in the US who was jailed uh, for producing an HIV drug or something like that. And he, they were selling one for like close to, I'd forgotten, 3,000 USD a pill or something. The difference between the marginal cost, the additional or the average cost and the price was so huge. So on each product they were making, like they were producing it for like $10 a pair or five, they are selling a thousand because they were the only firm. Okay. And that is why people were a bit afraid about the discovery of the vaccine, whether if it was one firm that is uh, pricing it, you will all be in trouble. Yes, there's a hand, Bismarck. So please, uh, with the Monopoly market, can there be uh, government regulations in order for the firms not to charge abnormal prices? Yes, so in cases where we have very strong monopolies, governments have to come in. If government doesn't put in regulations to control them, we will all be in trouble. We will all be in trouble because they are going to always make the case that the average cost is so high, but we also don't have the data to even verify that because of information problem, asymmetry. So government has to come in. Sometimes government will go in and even subsidize because the guys are saying that we are producing a kilowatt for 10 Ghana. So we want to sell it at 12. Governments will say, no, you can't do that. Then uh, you sell it at six, but I will take the remaining four. But in, principle, in actual sense, they are still selling at 10. It's just the government is absorbing the rest. So, so these are the issues when you have one firm producing. There are inefficiencies on all sides. Okay, we can get higher prices. Government may have to come in and subsidize also. So yeah, it's not fun. But any firm that finds a product that he's the, that firm is the only producer, they are in big, good business. Okay. If I find a product that I'm the only producer in Ghana. I probably will be planning my retirement. <laughs> I'll move to the North Pole somewhere and enjoy myself. You see, so if you are a monopolist, if you find a, if you find a product and you're the only police, I give me a call. <laughs> yeah, let me take uh, uh, more. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, Bismarck. Yeah. So last week you were talking about uh, the in Europe where by uh, utilities. Yes they have a lot of people in the market yeah. providing it. Well, did you have the chance to uh, maybe research about how they did it? So at least we can also adapt such methods so that we can, <laughs> what ECG and Greco people are doing, we can also <laughs> keep those issues. This man, you think they don't know? <laughs> It's like they know, they know exactly how other countries have done it. And they know, they've made the electricity generation competitive. You know, but here in our case, like the main input, the hydro is belongs to one guy, right? I would like the, the state owned, right? If people can produce power, and I know there are private uh, firms coming into produce, production of energy. If people, if as more firms enter the market, it will liberalize it, but the, the rate is so slow, okay? The rate is so slow, but if people can come in with other means of producing power, and then, then the price will come down. 
in Europe and other places, people are even producing solar at home and they are selling it back to the grid. Okay. So if you produce a lot, um, like you have a big capacity to produce power, you sell it back to the grid. There's a reverse, the back back, buy back policy. And so people produce. And then they were, if I remember correctly, they were giving households loans to buy solar panels. And then the household will sell the excess energy back to the grid. And it was like a model. And I'm sure they all know, I know people at the Ministry of Energy who are my friends <laughs> that I know that they know about all these things. I'm sure they have tried some of them. I hope so. Uh, so uh, in the long run, if we overproduce, uh, we can sell back to the grid. Ghana can also sell to this, to other African countries and we can get foreign exchange. Um, um, gradually, it will get there, but as for ECG, uh, they, they've actually improved quite a bit compared to 10, 20 years ago. They, they've improved. Now, even if you have a problem at home, you call, the fourth line will show up. Okay. I don't know about you, me. When I was growing up, there was no fourth line person in my area. There is only one guy, <laughs> the electrician, who fixes the problems. But now you can call them and then they respond. Yes, Christian. Uh, Moas, your hand is still up. Yeah, follow up. Sir. Yeah. Regarding bullet three, eh, to, yes. to sell more, they reduce the prices. If they want to. It's not, I, they I, don't. Okay, okay. If they want to, it's like the normal demand. If they want to and they sell, they reduce the price to five, they can sell more. More mm. people will use it, but they will hardly do that. They will go for <laughs> the highest and produce the lowest quantity. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. And they maximize profit. So they will, if, why will I do that? Why will I employ more people, expand my plants and all that mm. at the cost? That's what I was coming to I won't do that. I, yeah. The overall aim is to maximize profit. Yeah, they won't do that. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me summarize the key characteristics of the market. It will highlight some of the things that Moas, you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, so this is just a, uh, I don't expect you to guys to memorize the graph. The key point here is that the monopoly price is always is higher than the average total cost for the monopolist. Okay. So it's going to make profit. This case is not very common for a monopolist where the average total cost is higher than the, the price. Unless the product, nobody wants it or nobody likes it. Yeah, or the only producer, but there's no, people don't like it. And then the price you are selling, but you are making a loss. Monopolies will not be in this state. Okay. Monopolies will always stay uh, a case where the profit is higher. Um, let me see how where I can, good point to end. Um, the class starts at what? Um, 11.30 and ends at 1.30, I think. Okay. Yeah, Bismarck, your hand is still up. You can come back. Uh, please, is there is there a possibility that uh, in the mono, monopoly market there will be a good that people don't like? You have to be special to produce that good. <laughs> like, uh, because <laughs> <laughs> you have to be to produce a good. They are the only producer. Nobody likes. Then the reason why nobody's producing it is that because nobody likes the good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go around and say you're a genius. You have come up with the good. Uh, nobody's producing, but there's no market for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be a special case. <laughs> All right. So barriers to entry, uh, barriers to entry and exit. Uh, it's a follow-up to the conditions that give firms power in the market. Barriers to entry and exit. Okay. What are the barriers to entry? Um, you're saying barriers to entry prevent competitors from entering the market. So I've highlighted some of them, so I'll go through them quickly. Important examples are patents and copyright. These are all barriers, government regulations, lines, state ownership, state-owned enterprises. Sometimes they are so protected that it, it makes it difficult for new firms to come into the market because it's an uneven, uh, playing field, right? If I'm coming in and the state enterprise is also producing something similar 
and I will not come in. Okay, so it can serve as a barrier to entry. Tariffs and non-tariff barriers, so huge taxes and all that can serve as a barrier. And then, as I talked about, uh, I mentioned earlier of natural monopolies, the firm economies of scale, the firm is just so big. Okay. Lower cost of production than your competitors. Okay, that gives that serves as a barrier. There's one firm that is producing the item as 10 pesos and is able to sell at 20 pesos and make profit. All other firms are producing at 30 pesos. You can't stay in that industry. Okay. There's a lower cost firm in that industry. So lower cost of production than competitors. As I mentioned earlier on control of uh, input, cause a barrier, it creates a barrier to entry. And if you control the distribution channel, you also, it prevents other from entering. Like for them to transport their products, they have to come to you, but you're competing with them on the output. Right? If you control channels, like the refrigeration vans at the ports and other things. If you control that, you can charge them a higher price. They can compete with you. Okay, so that is a very good. Or you control the warehouse. So uh, high research and development expenditures are as in the pharmaceutical industry, and it's very common even in the tele telecom telecommunication, mobile phones, and all these laptops markets. If you fail to invest in research and development, you'll be out of business in no time. Okay. Amazon and Co are buying, uh, Facebook, they're buying apps that are just coming up because they know that they will be important in the future. So you have to spend a lot on research and development. Okay. So that can create a, a barrier. If the research and development cost is so high, I can go into the industry, but to spend and become relevant I need to spend a lot on research, but I don't have that means, then I will not enter into mm -hmm. the, the industry. Okay. So do a very good analysis uh, before uh, you go into uh, the market. Um, so we are saying that even though there is no absolute barrier, to, there may be no absolute barrier to entry, the monopolist can also deter people okay, by their actions. Okay. And they can go into predatory pricing okay, or threats of a price war. I'm the only firm. Okay, think of it, the scenario. Another firm wants to enter the market. The that other firm's profit estimation is based on my numbers, right? How much I'm selling my product. So Diamond wants to sell cement. They are saying that, okay, let's estimate the profit we will make as Diamond. If we sell the cement at Gassem's price of 40 Ghana cities, what is our estimated profit, right? So they, they kind of project what their profit margin will be. Now, Gassem hears that Diamond is coming into the market. If Gassem wants to go into predatory price, and the moment Diamond invests into factory and other things and ready to come, they just reduce the price to 30 Ghana or 25 Ghana. That just makes all the profit estimations by Diamond just bogus. Like you can't use it. Because at 25 Ghana cities, if Diamond input that and recalculate the profit margin, they may be making losses if they go, so they will back out. So some firms can go into predatory pricing or the threat of a price war that if you enter this market, I'm going to reduce prices. And that action uh, can affect the competitors. So you hear that this is the price. Your investors will say, no, 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 no. At this low price, we cannot make money. And the, more, and the moment the competitors leave the market, they increase the price to make up for all their losses. <laughs> okay. okay, so that is a, an example. Yeah, Bismarck. Yeah, so if, if your competitors want to, want to reduce their price or perform this price war, and you, are, you have the capacity to, to buy all their goods and even their company, and you increase the price, what scenario is that? <laughs> well, somebody did that. <laughs> uh, so Mark, you are saying this from like a factual point of view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I saw, it, it was a, a funny video that they did. I think it was a group. 
we were discussing something and someone brought it up. The man was selling something and a competitor came in and the man reduced or like reduced the price and the competitor bought everything of his and increased the price. And increase the price of that thing. Yes. Well, that's weird. Since, since now he, he owns everything, he increased the price. And the one who initially wanted to do the price war has nothing to sell. That is weird. Uh, that is weird. I, I, I don't know the market, so I cannot speak to it. But how can you sell and sell your company? If it's no, the no. output... Yeah, others, others can come to you if it's at the output level. Like I produce a lot of things and uh, I reduce it and you buy the output, but I'm still producing and I'm still in the market. People still know me that I'm in the market. I will sell at a, at a lower price. You cannot go back and sell at a higher price. So for the firm to sell the entire business to this guy, uh, that is a terrible business idea plan. But say, is, is there a possibility that if someone reduces his his store price and uh, a company can buy or so, because we are talking about the input, if there's a a particular input that you can yes. acquire everything and manage, you are supposed to do that. If you can do that, very economic. Yeah. So what people would do, like price war, people would like price war stuff. What they would do is that they prepare for price war. So they save up a lot of money. So the profit that they've earned in the past 10 years, they are saving up for. Okay. So meaning that in the next five years, they are willing to take losses because they have a lot of reserves. So they can go into that. If they reduce the price and the competitor also reduces the price because the competitor has also a big capacity to withstand these shocks, right? So the competitor can also reduce. You reduce to five, I reduce to five. You reduce to three, I reduce to three. Profit levels in that industry will be close to zero for all of them. And for us consumers, we will benefit, right? So if the other competitor has the power to match you, then at the end, it would be a terrible idea to go into price war. Then all of you could have colluded and charged a higher price and share the market 50-50 and make your profit and go away. But if you go into a terrible price war without the information that your competitor is also big enough to compete with you, and then you'll be selling it at buy one, get one free. And then the profit levels will be so low for everybody. So a very good thing that you want to go into a price war, uh, just to deter uh, other people. But I can, see, I can see settings where firms can do that or want or like to do that. Uh, it's possible. Uh, it's possible. Yeah, Latin. Yes, sir. Um, we've seen instances where it's been rumored that uh, there was a there was a certain telco com company that was uh, entering the Ghanaian market, and uh, there was another big telco company that bought all their chips and bent them. We've heard that. We've also seen instances where um, there is a there was an idea to. Um, take out monopoly from the cement industry. And then there were other uh, companies that were introduced. The existing companies ended up buying shares in the new companies just to, <laughs> just to, control, just to control the pricing and the market. So we didn't have the needed effect. Just my contribution to the discussion. Uh, the, the business is not a joke, right? Like. Seriously, you've gone for a loan, like one million or cities to start this business. Your house is on the line, right? So people can do things like good people become bad people. Uh, they will do everything possible to, to sustain the business. So the, 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 the telcos one, I've heard about it, but I just didn't want to mention it. <laughs> I've read rumors about burning. Uh, some, one of my students, I think two years ago, was saying that he knows because he was whatever involved, whatever. Yeah, saying that uh, they, they even dumped the chips somewhere. And the other company felt, thought that they were selling, but they were just dumping, nobody was using it. So people can do those predatory activity, right? It's illegal, you can't do that, but I kind of envisage that. The, the buying of the, uh, the, the shares is the smart move, okay? It's a very smart move. So if that company is doing well, you still make profits of it. And now you are in 
you know what is going on in the other company, right? If they are, you control the market. So it becomes like a second grade to your company. <laughs> and if they are going into a higher value cement, you're already ahead in research on that, you know? So it's a very smart move. Okay, so people do that. People, in fact, people can, even firms can implant spies in other firms. Okay. And the guy works for you as a cleaner, but he's on a CEO pay in another company. So whatever you are doing, he's feeding them in the, with the information. So you take action A and they respond, action B, because they have already planned for you. Okay. There's no room. Okay. Treat people well. <laughs> When you own businesses, treat people well, okay? So that they don't mess you up, okay? Yeah, so you can see examples of that predictory pricing or threat of, uh, threat of price war. Some firms, they will not do the predictory pricing directly. They will just increase capacity. They will supply too much and, and oversupply will push prices down. So creating excess capacity, which signals to potential suppliers that a monopolist might react to competition by increasing output and therefore reducing market price. They will just re supply so much and the price level fall. They can also create excess, like not excess, they'll create brand loyalty. They will spend so much on advertising to deter others. Okay. They'll spend so much every morning, afternoon, evening, adverts are running. You cannot compete with the adverts. So you will not enter the market. Morning, evening, you, if you compete with the adverts, you have minus <laughs> profit. You take huge losses because all your money will be going to advertising. Okay. And high research and development expenditure as in the pharmaceutical, as I explained. So if the research development is very high, you will not also enter the market. Okay. Uh, a, a final barrier to entry is a barrier to exit. So sometimes the exit requirements are so high that you will not enter the market. So a final barrier to entry is a barrier to exit. You just cannot enter the market because if you enter the sunk cost is, if you want to exit, the sunk cost is so high that you will not want to enter the market. Okay. So the main obvious barrier to exiting, uh, facing a firm or case where there are appreciable sunk costs. Okay. Sunk costs arise when there is a need for high investment by a new entrant. So some industries, you need to put in a lot of capital to be at that level with those who are in the market. Mm -hmm. okay. And these are costs which cannot be recouped if firms subsequently decide to leave the industry. All right, um, let me try and end on this slide. Okay. So welfare losses. There are welfare losses associated with monopoly. And these welfare losses fall into four categories. Whenever you have a monopolist in a very important market, they are welfare losses. Society loses in a certain way. What are the four welfare losses or group of welfare losses associated with monopoly? Monopoly, when you have a monopolist in the market, you have higher prices, higher profit for the monopolist and lower output. The monopolies will produce a lower output by charge you a higher price and make lots of profits. Okay. So that is uh, first welfare loss. Second loss here is loss of consumer surplus. Okay, I'll come to that in a jiffy. And then the third one is high production costs. So the monopolies can be inefficient in production, wastage. So well, society loses that resources could have those type of resources could have been channeled to something else but they are just simply inefficient they are using so many workers uh, wastage in the system okay water will be flowing and nobody's fixing it high production cost and then monopolies you have loss of consumer choice whilst in perfect competitive market there are a lot of choices but in monopoly market loss of consumer choice let me explain the loss of consumer surplus and then we can call it a, a day. Consumer surplus, you know what a surplus is. Okay. Let's say you go to Accra Central. I hope I, okay, I'm recording. Yeah, you go to Accra Central, you want to buy a shoe. Okay. 
and in your mind, leaving your house, you are willing to pay, the highest you are willing to pay for the shoe is, is um, 100 Ghana cities. Okay, let me use the whiteboard. Trust my, try to follow, okay. Let me clean up this a bit. So let's say that you, your plan is that the highest you are willing to pay is for the shoe, leaving your house, beyond which you will not buy the shoe is 100 Ghana cities. So your willingness to pay is 100 Ghana cities, your highest. And you went into the market. Let me clean this also. And you got the shoe for 50 Ghana cities. So you got it for 50 Ghana cities. Your consumer surplus is therefore the difference between how much you are willing to pay, okay, 100, and how much you actually pay. Okay, so this shaded, this area here, let me get the shade. This area here will represent your surplus. Okay, this area will represent your surplus. In a competitive market, because prices are low, consumers have a higher surplus because the price is low. The consumers will have, if the shoe market is competitive, consumers will have, the, you will get the price at 50 Ghana. If it's a monopolist, you are saying that the monopolist will try to take away all your surplus. Means that the monopolist will charge you close to 100, your willingness to pay. This is where people say that you look back and see they'll call you back, <laughs> right? So if the monopolist is in the market, he's going to charge you. Let's say if the monopolist charges you, let me use this. The monopolist charges you 80 Ghana cities. I sell the shoot to you at 80 Ghana cities. What will be your surplus? Your surplus will just be the difference here, the area here. Pick another color. Okay, so if there's a monopolist, your surplus will just be the small box here. So the monopolist will squeeze you, it will charge you close to your will highest willingness to pay. Okay, you see, you maybe I am willing to pay 200 Ghana cities a month or 300 Ghana cities a month for electricity, All right? Um, if ECG charges me, or if I buy 50 Ghana, if I buy 50 Ghana cities a, a month, that means I'm say, I have a lot of surplus to do other things, okay? But if ECG charges me close to my 300, then I don't have any surplus, okay? My highest willingness to pay, it's very small, okay? So monopolies will always charge you a very high price, 80, but the quantity and the quality they will give you will be lower than if you were in a competitive market. The quality or the quantity Q here that you get, this Q will be lower than if you were in a competitive market. So that is what we are saying that you will lose consumer surplus. They will take out, out. It will charge you 80 and sell at Q1. And then this area which belong to you will now go to them. Okay. So that is what we are referring to as consumer surplus. Um, let me show you the graph, the official graph, and then you can call it a day. So this is what I'm saying. The PC is the competitive price. PM is the monopoly price. Okay. If you are in a competitive market, output will be higher at QC. But if you're in a monopoly market, it will charge you PM and only produce a lower quantity or lower quality for you. Okay. But charge you and take away this as its profit beyond perfect competition, okay? And we are saying that that will create uh, inefficiencies in the market. So that will create a case where if, if you are the PC, your, your surplus would have been, the, if the price is at a competitive level, if there were a lot of firms in the market, you'd be buying the product at PC, 50 Ghana. 
And if you buy the product at PC, you have this whole shaded area as your surplus, right? A plus B plus C as your surplus. Yes, but if the monopolist charges you PM, the A which belong to you will now go to the monopolist, okay? Will now go to the monopolist. So you will be left with only B. C is called a debt weight loss when you have a monopoly. When you have a monopolist, the wastage in the system, the welfare loss in the system is captured by C. It's like combination of inefficiency, corruption, or all manner of things are captured by this. C doesn't go to the consumer and C doesn't go to the producer. It's lost in the system, a lot of inefficiencies. Okay, so the water is flowing, nobody's checking all these welfare losses uh, are there, okay? You only get B as your, your remaining surplus. The monopolist takes your A and B is captured in all the efficiency problems that we have, okay? So that is the case when you have a monopolist. C would have, an a perfect market, C would have gone to the consumer, okay? And A would have gone to the consumer, but in a monopoly market, they squeeze your surplus. And that is what uh, we refer to here as uh, when you have a monopoly, you have higher prices. You guys have seen that higher prices. PM is higher than PC. Uh, lower outputs, you've also see, seen that QM is lower than QC. Loss of consumer surplus, they will squeeze you that uh, you, you, your surplus will still be, your surplus will be very small, okay? Higher production costs, inefficiencies, and loss of consumer choice, okay? All right, any question now? All right, I'm going to end here. Um, uh, the class rep or whoever is recording today, please make the uh, videos available to students. Yeah, Bismarck, come. Uh, go ahead. Sir, please. My question is not related to uh, okay. our okay. topic today. One I was second. asking uh, with our exams, will it be sit down or will it be take <laughs> home?